Why did you feel compelled to write a book about the existence of God? Um, what caused this book to really come into existence was there's a singing group uh, that many of them go to our church called the Newsboys. So they had this big hit song called God's Not Dead and kids are singing God's Not Dead and so they're excited about it. So they produced a little video and they asked me to help in that and then other things like that. Next thing you know, they said, would you write a book? So I put this book out, wrote it mostly 2012 to help give the evidence for faith so that believers can really have the substance beyond their own experience. Many believers know God is real, but they can't show He's real. And so that's the goal is like 1 Peter says that you should always be ready to give a defense or the, the reason for the hope that's within you. So that's what I'm hoping God's Not Dead will do. Now for people who maybe they don't believe in God or they do, the question always comes up that, you know, if God is real, why do bad things happen? Why is there evil? So what would you say to those people? Well, I mean, evil and suffering is a part of the world. I think people want a world where they, they think they could kind of engineer a world better than God. They want choice. They want to be able to choose. But also, if you have the right to choose or the, or the freedom to choose, then there's going to be the option to do the wrong thing. So um, really, people want evil to stop happening you know, around them. They just don't want evil to stop happening through them. Rather than create robots, he basically says, look, I'm creating you for a purpose, but I'm going to tell you what, you know, here's, he defines evil, God does. He denounces it. He says, don't do it. But ultimately, he has a plan to remove evil, starting in the human heart, through the gospel, and then ultimately from the universe, which as it says in the book of Revelation, I saw new heavens and a new earth. So God is just as concerned about evil as we are, and he has a plan to defeat it, which is the, which is the message of hope we have. I don't want to be glib about it, because if somebody talks about evil, there's two kinds of questions. Either they're talking about theoretical evil, trying to kind of blame God for the problems in the world. But if somebody's had evil happen to them, in other words, if you've been hurt, then I don't want to trivialize that, because there is a lot of serious things. There's pain, there's terrorist attacks, there's famine, there's you know wars, genocide, and so none of that can just be glossed over. Uh, but really, the evil in the world is the manifestation. I would say it this way. The existence of evil isn't the evidence of God's absence in the universe, but the absence from our hearts. And so atheism doesn't, atheism doesn't take away the pain. It just takes away the hope. And so this is why we, when it comes to evil, we as believers have the answer. We can tell where it came from. We can tell its source, but we can also have a plan to say, here's how it's removed. Now, for people who want to, you know, share their faith and they want to be ready, you know, when people ask them a question, is, does God, is God real? Does he exist? Uh, I know you have something you call the God test. Yeah, what this is, this is the God test, and this has been blowing up in Africa. Basically, we teach people the, the SALT principle. You start a conversation, you ask questions, you listen, just like you're doing to me now. You're very respectful. You're listening, and then you tell the story. Many Christians start talking argue, get louder, and then they kind of kick people, you know. So that's the talk method. But we want to start conversations, and what the God test does, it asks the question, do you believe in God? And you can see all the different religions there. If they say yes, uh, that's side B for belief. If they say no, there's side A for atheist agnostic. And so what we teach are a series of questions that draw the unbeliever out, or maybe the doubter out. And that's why we have to learn when our time comes to talk, we have to really have the answers and we have to study. Yeah. So. Now my final question, um, you are a pastor, you've started churches, you've written books. For you personally, what has been something in your life that has constantly told you that God is not dead, that he is indeed alive? You know, when I was, when I first, when I became a Christian as a junior in college, I didn't like Jesus. Jesus to me was a guy, a skinny guy with a sheep around his neck. I didn't want anything to do with it. You know, Christians like to kind of smack when they talk, hallelujah. And so people used to come up, hallelujah, and they always would, you know, smacking and praying, you know, and I just thought, please, I would go into Christian meetings and everybody was smacking, hallelujah, so I thought. But a guy got in my face without a tic-tac and uh, a breath mint, if, if you don't know what that is, and uh, they don't have that brand there, but he began to preach to me about Jesus, and I really came to Christ as a junior in, in college. So I go back to the change. I mean, I can tell you scientific, philosophical evidence and the ultimate historical evidence of God becoming a man in Christ, walking on the earth. 
You know, you're talking about a science experiment. Jesus said, test me. He was tested again and again. So God couldn't have done anything more undeniable than manifest himself as a man and walk among us, be questioned. His miracles weren't tricks. Magicians do one trick and then they don't do it again. Jesus repeated his miracles because they weren't tricks. They weren't illusions. They were signs pointing to who he was. But the ultimate sign was his resurrection. And, he, and Christianity started in the very city where it would have been easiest to disprove, Jerusalem, three days later. So I can go through the scientific, the philosophical, the, the, uh, the historical, but the ultimate thing, as I'm saying, is the living proof that uh, Jesus has changed my life, he's changed my family. And I think for anybody watching, you know, that's what we end up saying, hey, I was blind, but now I see. But I do think we can't just have the subjective experience as much as we can have that, and that's good for us. We still need to learn and study because I think our arguments and our evidence is overwhelmingly more powerful than the skeptics, but it's of no use if we don't know it.